Podcasters Roundtable, round 51, challenging the status quo. All right, so if you haven't already, of course, let's just put that call to action up front, which could be, is that the status quo? Is it normal to put your call to actions up front? Does everyone tell you to do that, or do you put them at the end? It's debatable. Go to podcastersroundtable.com slash guest, or just podcastersroundtable.com. Sign up, get on the list so that you can appear on the roundtable. We need every podcaster. That is the the big audacious goal, right, of the Podcasters Roundtable is to get every podcaster onto the roundtable at some point. And today we we landed a couple big fish, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we've got a, a, a returning roundtabler and a new roundtabler. It's going to be awesome. And, uh, yeah, before we jump into the definitions and what exactly challenging the status quo means for podcasting or us on this roundtable, let's meet said roundtable. Daniel... J. Lewis. That is, are you back to your regular name? Welcome back to the roundtable, Daniel. I, yes, I am back to my regular name. And in case you didn't know, Lanid Sewell is Daniel Lewis spelled backwards from last time. But I'm excited <laughs> <laughs> about this. I have challenged the status quo with uh, my own podcast and looking forward to talking about this. Awesome. Yes, you had to wait two weeks, people, for that if you if you didn't catch that on the last round. If you're wondering what the heck he's talking about, obviously go back to Podcasters Roundtable, round 50, check it out. And uh, welcome back, fresh off the road, Dave Jackson. Yeah, Dave Jackson from the schoolofpodcasting.com. Yes, uh, just teaching everywhere and anywhere and everything everywhere. It's... Uh, that's what I've been doing lately. A lot of fun. Glad to be. And you're gonna you're gonna teach a class like in a few hours, aren't you? Yeah, three thirty in the morning is when the next class starts. Looking forward to that. Uh, the global economy. Yeah, People it. are waking up. Somewhere in Asia, Dave. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think India is where my actual students are. Nice. That'll nice. be fun. Nice. And welcome back, returning roundtabler Harry. Thanks for joining us. Harry Duran, Podcast Junkies. Thank you so much. Uh, I get to make up for the fact that my first. Um, Time on Podcast Junkies, I did not have my microphone with me. I was traveling, so I feel good that I get, get to, to make up for that debacle. Your first appearance on the roundtable. On the roundtable, correct. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, then we enjoy hearing you in all your audio uh, beautifulness. I'm just making up some words here. Blender. All right, and the new roundtabler, heavy hitter, Rick, welcome to the roundtable. How are you? Good. It says tap out on your shirt, so, you know, heavy hitter goes right along with that. It's, yep. it's branding. Rick Calvert, New Media Expo. It sounds like everybody's getting a little plug in, so I'll do that too. Um, and I've got a headset, so I'll have to bring the microphone next time. There you go. See, these are good ways to get back on the round table. Claim that you didn't, <laughs> you claim that you didn't bring everything you wanted. And My fancy Heil mic is still in a box from New Media Expo, so well, I'll, I'll bust it out. Well, I think you have... Yeah. old school with the headset. That, that's challenging the status quo, right? There hey, you yeah, you know what? That's a good question because I'm not sure that it is, unless it's a, unless it's a direct challenge. But he says he's got a PR40 in the box, so that could be a statement in himself. Still in the box. Is that are those, I've also is, got that, a, is, that, is that like the Volkswagen drivers that say my other car is a, a BMW or something like that? What could else be. do you have, Rick? My, my, a fancy blue microphone around here somewhere too. All right, so you're a you're a little bit of a gear junkie, like some of us. It sounds like, and you're just collecting dust. Yeah, a little bit. No, so, actually, my I've never been able. I I could not get my blue to work with my old computer. Now I have a new computer, so I'm gonna bust it out and see if I can get it to work. It drove me crazy. Nice. All right. Well, and yeah. if you don't know, Rick, you plugged in MX, but Rick, you are the director for the New Media Expo, which we just wrapped up in Vegas back in like April, just a couple weeks ago. I like think a month uh, ago. Right now. What, a couple months? <laughs> one month. One okay. month. Okay, one month. That makes more sense. Yeah. Time flies. But we yeah. were all there, and uh, great job. I, this was the first year it blended with the NAB Expo, uh, and I know that was sort of like a dream come true for you. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, eight years in the making to, to make that happen, and um, I was very, very happy with it in general. I know I, I know lots of things that we can do better next time. I know Daniel has suggestions for me, things we could do better next time. Um, but, yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, you know, the only – a good reason to go back is now that's with the NAB. I didn't get to see half of what I wanted to see, so. Well, I'll tell you guys something real quick. Sorry, I don't want to turn this into a plug, but something I'm excited about. The radio section of NAB 
will be right next to us next year. Awesome. So a lot of the gear that people had to go run and see next time will be yeah. right there next to us uh, last time, next time. <laughs> One of the things that you guys, it was your first time for all of you guys, right, to NAB? No, no to NAB, for, NAB yes, yes. for me, yeah. So, you know, Dave and I took a little walk the first day. I just wanted to give him, like, this lightning tour and about half an hour of walking very briskly. And, you know, we just saw the front of the hall across all the halls. And I asked Dave, I said, okay, so I've been telling you about this for months. You know, he was pretty intimately involved. I said, did I describe it accurately to you? Is this how big you thought it was? And, you know, he was just, no, I, I couldn't comprehend how big this is. Um, yeah, I always give the example. I, gave, I kept giving the example that I had heard that there were there was at least one booth that probably had a helicopter in it. That's how big <laughs> yeah. this was, right? The booths, the one booth could be as big as well. There were booths bigger than the New Media Expo. There were booths, several booths bigger than all of <laughs> New Media Expo combined. Yeah, and and by the way, to tie that into your theme, Ray, I call that challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, just I wanted people to see how big this industry is that they are a part of because podcasting is a part of that industry. Um, that's my, I mean, I, I guess that's a good lead in. I think Daniel, you might've mentioned this in the, in the pre-show run up, but is podcasting itself challenging the status quo? I think it is. And that's part of why I named my show the audacity to podcast is it's not about the software. It's about the guts, the courage, the, 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 the audacity to do this thing when no one else will give you a platform to speak with your voice. You might not be able to get into your um, into your local market to be able to speak at conferences or anything like that, but you might be able to start your own show and have an audio platform there where you're speaking with your voice and you can do it however you want. That's the awesome thing about podcasting. It doesn't matter what anyone else tells you to do. It doesn't matter how the successful people are doing it. You can do it how you want to do it. And I think that is, in, in, for everyone basically who's launching a podcast, I think they are to some degree challenging the status quo. Yeah, That's right I, now. Go for it. Yeah, I, can't, I, I, I always say it during my show that, you know what, I'm going to try something and it's my show, so I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. And a lot of times, I mean, one of the experiments was I had to do a, a trip to London, so I didn't have a guest lined up, so I just did a, a podcast of me talking, walking around London, which was, I, I, I almost thought about it too much, and I said, is this right, or does it sound weird, uh, and then at the end of the day, I, I think I always come back to, it. it's my podcast, if I only end up with like 20 listeners, they know what they're going to get, and they're going to, something occasionally kooky every now and then, um, but I think it just adds your personal stamp on it. So, but in terms of challenging the status quo what does that mean i mean is it because you just threw caution in the wind and it's not like it's yeah not programmed and yeah i didn't i mean i wanted to do i know people do solo episodes every now and then but i said well i don't want to do the typical solo episode where you just sit in a room and just talk about the past week i said let me try i tried i had a road lavalier mic and the sound quality wasn't the best and i did some of it while i was back in the hotel but i was just i just sort of pieced to frankenstein an episode i think from a bunch of audio that I had while I was out there. Did you get feedback on that? How did it go? Yeah, I think uh, a couple of folks listened to it and I said, I heard that one episode you did where you're walking around London. It's uh, it was something a bit different, so uh, I like it. Yeah, very cool. And so I guess we should back up a little bit and really kind of, I mean, what is what is challenging the status quo? I mean, f formal definition is the status quo is the current state of affairs, right? Um, a synonym would be normalcy, and then I kind of would say business as usual, right? And so in podcasting, first of all, we talked about podcasting challenging, you know, the, the medium itself actually challenging the status quo. Uh, I think that's changing. We are definitely pulling up alongside, and I think legitimized now as a medium right alongside radio and TV, you know, whatever, newspaper, you name the medium. I think that's because what do we have now in the U.S.? I believe at least a third of the population has listened or listens to podcasts. So it's becoming the new normal, right? So when we talk about challenging the status quo, I think the challenge for this round is not necessarily a list of things that people do because they maybe lack the knowledge. Like they don't know to use 
feed burner if Dave Jackson says don't use feed burner. They don't know that. They're not necessarily making an effort to challenge the status quo. They just don't know. Or maybe they don't have the budget for a really nice microphone. They're not making a statement. They just can't afford a new microphone. So for us, we need to figure out what are those things that are direct challenges to whatever has become normal in podcasting. And there's something to say there about how what the, what was the status quo back in the day, as Roadkill Dave Jackson would say, <laughs> or <laughs> that's an inside joke too. Oh no, it's in the chat. Daniel, welcome to the chat. First of all, Fred Castaneda checking in. Jim Collison and uh, and Max Flight and uh, Dave or Daniel said when he heard me say uh, Dave was fresh from the road, he he thought of Roadkill. So that's your new nickname, Dave. Roadkill Dave Jackson. But Dave, <laughs> tell us what do you what was the status quo back in 2005? Well, was there one? The status quo back then was feed burner. Because yeah. we're all like, how are we going to get it? You know, iTunes launches, and they're like, oh, by the way, we've launched. Here's the list of our demands to get into the store. you got to have this, this, that tag. And we're like, oh, how are we going to make the tag? But you were at the, let's, hey, this is good. You were at the first, what is now New Media Expo, used to be the blogging, but what was the first one called, Rick? <laughs> okay, the first one was called Blog World and New Media Expo. Correct. Were you there at that one? I was there, yeah. All right, so you two were there, Dave... And Rick, Dave, you were there, right, in Orange, California? Yeah. So there, I mean, there really, my point is there really was, tell us about how raw, well, there was no status quo. No one knew what to be doing, right? Now, that was the, the beauty of it is because we were all trying to figure it out. And, you know, we're all walking around with our little iRiver recorders trying to figure out, you know, what to use for hosting. And, and The status quo was radio. When you were talking about audio yeah, um, we're talking about audio programming, right? It was radio. So, what do you think podcasting? What? What? How did podcasts get born? Is it just CB radio junkies found a they could publish online, or was it? Do you guys feel it was some type of challenge to uh, media that was being put out in 2005? I, my first question would be, who can settle the argument of who the first podcaster was? Because uh, uh, there are a lot of people who claim that. Moniker. Well, you know, I, it's so funny these days because now I, it seems like every couple of months I hear, I see the Podfather and I tweeted it out. I said, if um, look, I love uh, Ira Glass, but if you refer to him as the Podfather, you need a history lesson. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that is not right. But lots of people are getting that moniker. So as far as the first podcast, I don't know. Drop some knowledge. Who who's got? Well, David H. Lawrence claims to be one of, if not the first, one of the first. Um... I think Dave Weiner, who will claim responsibility for RSS technology, um, definitely would have claim to that. I don't think Adam Curry w claimed to be the first podcaster, but maybe the first like mega podcaster rock star. Yeah. Um, and there are several others that come every year. Who's to uh, Leo Laporte? Obviously, was very very early, but again, I don't think he would claim to be the first. Um, uh, who are some of the guys that, that you guys know who who would make that claim that they were the first? I well, know we always give Dave Jackson the <laughs> credit for being the first to podcast about podcasting. I don't, we, don't, we don't go outside our own tiny little circle. Wow. <laughs> he set a big trend there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and Dave, part of your show is, I mean, it's it started because there were no, there was no status quo. People didn't know how to do this thing, right? No, I mean, we had like, you know, Michael Butler was the music guy. Um, we had uh, C.C. Chapman was a music guy, but we had uh, Michael Gohagen was the movie review Michael guy. Michael Gohagen, he, he had a podcast about podcasting, right, early days? Um, he had Grape Radio, yeah. Yeah, and he had, uh, yeah so, you know, but everybody had, like, their own little niche kind of thing, and then you had, uh, you know, the Leos and the um, Victor Cadillac was uh, Personal Mac something. Oh, Victor Kaye. Yeah. Do you, thank you. Uh, Good luck Victor. with that. Oh, yeah, Victor. Victor rocks. He is Victor a rocks. MacBook person. He got mad at me for insulting Apple one day. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 a whole decade of that was born, right? I mean, yep. we still have that debate. So, Daniel, do you think podcasting was just a hobbyist venture because the tech came about? Do you think oh, some of the people were getting in to challenge the status quo of Available content. Do you think there's anything there in the early days? 
I think some of it is uh, in the early days, just people who geeky people that is realizing that, hey, here's a way that I can have a show on the internet and use my voice to share my message. And before podcasting was really popular, the only way to really do that was to have just MP3 files or video files on your website. YouTube didn't exist back then. And yes. you just had to get lucky and be found by someone or be famous. But there was no core directory where people could find this kind of content syndicated automatically. And I think that's what appealed to people is to realize, hey, I can start a show on my own for just a few dollars, basically, and maybe reach an international audience. Yeah, you had you had sites like Live 365, but those were live streaming, and you had to go there. It wasn't where you, like now, where you get it on your phone and every place else. And it was also, you know, you'd go over and click play, and you're in the middle of episode number seven. And it wasn't like you could go and you know, listen to the beginning and start over. There were definitely people podcasting to make money I, from the very, very early days, the first podcast expo, um, I mean, there were a lot of people with companies. There was a big um, divide, I bet, at the yeah, first yeah. expo. I, re I remember Paul Culligan and I were talking about, I think we might be able to monetize this, and we were standing in the bar of uh, whatever that was in California, and people looked at us like we were the devil. It's like, it's yeah. art, man. You can't monetize art. This is my art. Man. And we were like, all right, well, you do your art thing. I'm going to try to pay some bills. And... Uh, <laughs> They they just looked at me like I was. Oh. We are not completely removed from that. I you still have the divide. You still have some divide between those that would that are in it for profit and those that are in it for the love, right? Hundred yeah. percent. Yep. You, you and never know. shall the two meet. Yeah. <laughs> they well, met. I think either camp will argue vociferously about the merits of the 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 stand that they take. Especially the people who just come in it and they just try to apply the the, the same monetization strategy that they existed for them in a previous channel, you know, be it a blog or, or something similar or a YouTube channel. I, so, I think a way to step, uh, by the way, to because we're talking about that making money versus not making money. I think having a podcast just for the sake of having a podcast today, instead of having a podcast to sell product widget X would be challenging the status quo as of today. Well, that's good. That that That's a kind of, I mean, I'm curious. First of all, did we succeed, right? Did we challenge the status quo if in the early days? And has how has it changed, right? Are we now, when I said that we pulled up alongside other mediums as legitimate forms of programming, has, has podcasting sort of become the status quo? It's normal to listen to a podcast. It's normal to start a <laughs> podcast. Are we not there yet? Not I don't quite. think we're there yet. Almost. Yeah. When car manufacturers are are building technology into their cars to make it easier to listen to podcasts, you're almost there. I I about lost it. I was at Target and my my license plate on my car is podcast. And I got <laughs> out and a guy walked by and he goes, "Do you do podcasts?" And I go, "Actually, I help people teach podcasts and gave him the pitch." And he's like, oh, man, I love uh, the Nerdist and the blah, blah, blah. So the fact that I didn't have to explain to that guy what a podcast was, I'm like, man, we've come a long way. Yeah. So the first, man, three to five years, it was like everybody had to say, no, I don't need an iPod. No, I don't need a Mac. It was just. You pretty much had to be a geek to listen to a podcast yeah. in those early days. And yeah. Dave, you are a geek. <laughs> Yeah, podcast license plate. You own it, so hey, yeah. I, I'm the owner who has that here in California. Oh man, somebody's got to. Someone, you think so? You think you know, so? Yeah. I think a modern uh, disruption here that's challenging the status quo is with NPR and really Gimlet Media getting into the space now with podcasting, storytelling. And, yeah, some of these. Well, not just storytelling, because that has been around for a long time in podcasting. I mean, since the beginning, people have had storytelling podcasts and doing things in kind of a similar way and having some good success with it in different ways. But uh, what I think is challenging the status quo is with Gimlet Media bringing an entire team to this and they are making a whole production. They are making a show choosing to distribute it as an audio podcast instead of any other platform that they could realistically do. They could start a TV show if they wanted to. I'm sure they have the platform to be able to do that. They could have a radio show. They've had radio shows before. So 
choosing the podcasting platform, they're bringing all of this talent and money and marketing and skill into the space and kind of, I think, challenging the status quo of podcasting is for the independence. It's for the one guy producing the content and maybe one other person editing the content for him. And it being that, or usually it's just one person. But here they come in, a team, a year of production before they launch, and they're they're challenging things. Yeah, I mean, the big boys have arrived, right? I mean, we are, what's our competition? Probably at this point, it's not radio, right? For people who are going to listen to your show, now you're up against some amazing content and now highly produced content inside the podcast section in the iTunes store, wherever you're getting it, right? Um, I looked at Pocket Cast the other night, and I went to the featured page, and I had a hard time not subscribing to everything, and I don't have that many podcasts. I was like, wow. I, it really felt like podcasts had kind of really arrived when I just could not stop seeing content I want to consume. I mean, and I'm talking quality. The artwork looked beautiful. The audio sounded great. The, the ideas were fresh. It was. It's really cool. I think this year has been a crazy time in podcasts as part of this whole status quo of we are becoming uh, the new normal, maybe. Yeah, and I, th I know that Rob Walsh drives me crazy every time you mention the word renaissance. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't been around in it as long as you guys, but I, I just, in, if you measure it by how much the normal person knows and understands and can speak to a uh, podcast, I just see that more, more and more happening in the past, you know, six, six to twelve months, even recently, past six months, with startup and with serial. So I, I have to say. This is something I get on my soapbox about a lot. We really are repeating history. Mm -hmm. If you were to talk about this renaissance in podcasting and you know what Daniel was talking about with Gimlet Media and some other folks, they're just doing what they did in old radio. Yeah, like I thought, and, radio. yeah with, with Gimlet, they're not, they're not recreating anything. They're just bringing it to podcasting. It's a, it's a new platform to distribute you know, a similar type of content that they did already. Right. But I mention this because we in new media in general, not just podcasters, try to – are guilty of thinking we're doing something new. We're teaching these old guys how to do new things. We're pioneers. And the truth is if you look back at the history of radio, television, publishing, you will see the future of podcasting and all of new media. Um we we had a guy give a keynote a couple of years ago in New York um, uh, about the founder of CBS Radio and the founder of Time Magazine. And half the audience was excited, saying, wow, that's really cool. I get it. The other half was, what's this crazy guy talking about? I'm like, you guys, he, he's showing you the future. Um, yeah, and I think that's true in – I. That's not new. History repeats itself, right? I mean, I'm going to be wearing tie dye after I'm wearing this bright. You know, you're like <laughs> everything comes back, and it. What's you know, I, new? I find myself. I've been looking for my Iron Maiden tie dye shirt for weeks. There you go. It's going to be awesome. It's in a box somewhere. You know, I and I, I often find myself thinking, you want to be rich? Just go find something that was really popular in the 20s and bring it back. And people think that's an amazing idea. But so yes, we are not doing anything necessarily that hasn't been done. But I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I mean, I think what's different? What's different? Accessibility. I mean, the fact that, uh, granted, a lot of all the different technologies um, and formats existed uh, in, in the way they were originally, like radio, the quality radio, the fact that um, NPR would take a year and a half to, to produce a radio show. That's nothing new, obviously. But I think the combination of the high quality production values and the accessibility and the fact that we don't need to put a cable in our laptop to sync up and to get the latest episode and the fact that you can, like you said, right, go on iTunes and within the span of seconds have just a whole season of new content, um, quality content on, de on demand. Content on demand, that's what's new. The, the ease of use of the technology is what's new to, to create and the ease of use to consume. That what about the role? What about the role of community? Are, are we more connected? I mean, we're global. That's definitely true, and and the ability to not broadcast but have a conversation. And you hate those freaking cliches, but it is true where the audience can participate. 
But again, when you go backwards in time, and I'll use music now as an analogy. My wife and I were just watching this great Frank Sinatra documentary. Back in those days, people were much closer to their fans. Mm -hmm. The venues were smaller. They were more intimate. They actually talked to them. You know, one of the cool things about the Rat Pack was they hung out at the casinos in Vegas. Yeah. They would be out drinking and then go up on stage and then come back and drink and gamble some more. Right. And uh, they were part of the community. Well, let's go way, way back. I mean, Patreon is born on the concept that there used to be patrons of the arts, right? Exactly. There was community that supported the artist, and we're seeing that again. So Now, you couldn't connect with, again, this technology allows us to do. You couldn't connect with like-minded people all over the world. Like, that is an amazing thing. And to do what you're doing right now would have cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Right. Before. Also, that kicking down of the door, which is what it was so exciting for me um, in the early days when I heard two dudes in a basement producing terrible content, yet suddenly I could just get to iTunes and hear it. It meant the gatekeepers. We hear it all the time. But, you know, I didn't have to go to someone and say, can I have a show? Can I put my voice out there? Which, you know, kind of Daniel mentioned. It's just like it was there for the taking. I mean, how tantalizing was it like, learn a couple things, grab a microphone, and go. For me, it was a video camera, but, you know, totally amazing that the barrier to entry has been dropped to almost nothing, and it, and it drops all the time because things are becoming cheaper and technology is becoming easier, right? Yep. But I'm, so I'm curious, if we're not doing anything new, there are a couple new aspects, then how do we challenge the status quo? I mean, Rick, I don't know if it ties in at all because I know an idea you pitched for the roundtable a long time ago you said something about podcasters are their own worst enemy or are podcasters their own worst enemy. And I think you sort of alluded to that here where you said um, sometimes podcasters think they're sort of on an island or they put themselves on, even on a pedestal like we're doing this thing that you don't understand, right? Which yep. is not true. So thinking what do small. you think? Thinking small. But yep. You need to think big. And I think that's challenging the status quo. You think remember, podcasters in general think small? Yep. I think content I mean? creators in general think small, not just podcasters. Oh, what does make thinking small mean? So Cute. when uh, the original Podcast Expo moved to Vegas, there was this huge uproar about moving out of Ontario where it was so intimate and we could Ontario. all hang out. It was one hotel. I said orange, and, sorry. That's all right. And, uh, and, oh, Vegas is too big and we'll all get lost and it's going to suck now. And I thought... We started Blog World and New Media Expo in Vegas because when I had the idea to do this, I'm like, this is the biggest media revolution in all of human history. You know, it's books, radio, television, magazines, newspaper, all being reinvented simultaneously at the same time. That That is mind-blowingly huge, and we see it every day. And I said, this event needs to be in Vegas from day one because Vegas is the event capital of the world. And we deserve to be there. The light should be brighter and bigger on all of us more. That's why we, we wanted to go to NAB, because that's where the biggest, most successful people in our industry are. And to say, oh, we need to be in our own little club and hold it to ourselves, and we're not good enough for them, or they're not good enough for us, or they're different than us, I think it's stupid. So to... to uh, well, we end up... We have, have a very mild opinion. No, yeah. do it. Please. This is the, <laughs> the round table is opinions. That's what we want. We want the sharpest opinions possible. We we end up preaching to the choir. And what was interesting is that the pool party, on one hand, you know, there are going to be those people like, well, we were too scattered out and it was too far away from the hotel or whatever. But on the other hand, I was at the pool party and I turn around and there's like four guys and I just start talking to them. Uh, I think two of them were program directors. One was an ex DJ. So a bunch of radio guys were there. Vice president of CBS. Yeah, we all just swapping ideas. About, Who now has a podcast network. Nice. Hmm. And uh, so we're just swapping ideas about podcasting and what is it and, and you know, here's how we prepare for our shows and here's how we do a daily radio show. What do you do with your podcast? And if this had been, you know, back in Ontario, I would have been sitting around, you know, talking to you guys, which is great. I love that. I, you know, that's, that's the awesome because we all, it's another set of eyeballs and ears and things like that. And that's the beauty of that because you want to build that connection with your current community. But it's those four guys, those four new guys that, you know, I got their cards right here. And I can, you know, call them up and, and we're buddies now. So That larger point, sorry guys, is 
get outside whatever your little circle is. Get outside of that. Yeah. And and even if you're doing something a format that's already been done, but let's say again you're doing a podcast about podcasting, but you're copying a format with a guy who does audio books about uh, um, uh, steampunk. You're different. You're completely different than everybody else in your space. And that's a great way to challenge the status quo. Get out of your comfort zone, whatever that is. Go seek people out. So yeah, don't let me, let me clarify. I would love to hang out with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, right. Dave, don't worry. We're not taking it personally. Yeah, yeah we don't. Oh, you're just God. here. We know you're here for the money. So, <laughs> you know. We know you're here for the big po- podcast around table paycheck. Well, so. I think that everyone needs to realize there's a time to grow up and a time to put away in childish things. And there is that moment where, like, just in real life, you know, you have to stop playing with the Barbies. You have to stop playing with Legos and move on and do something else, you know, more adult, like grow up some. I think the podcasting industry is reaching that phase where, yes, there are some who still want to bring their Barbies and their Lego construction toys into this. And sure, there can be a place for that. But I think we're really now at this point where the media, traditional media is looking at us and seeing us as potentially disruptors, potentially partners, and we need to to jump in to help direct this, to guide this in the right direction. Yeah, you know, so I didn't, the cat's sort of out of the bag here with this conversation, but I didn't ask, which I wanted to ask up front. <laughs> What does the status quo mean to you in terms of podcasting, right? I mean, we come to this, I make the topic, it's a topic, but I want to make it broad and try not to tell you too much about what I'm thinking when I create it, uh, which you probably already know. Maybe we're, we, we're too far down the line, but I'm curious, you know, Harry, when you hear this topic, challenging the status quo, what would you think? What, what, what are you thinking about? What are we gonna talk I'm, about? I'm trying to get as few downloads as possible for my show. Yes, that's <laughs> That that would be a challenging. I guess that would be <laughs> a new normal, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I I think is this. If I think about something to say, I I try not to just. Am I going to say something, or am I going to do something with the show that's going to turn people off? And then I think, well, yeah. Then that, that I sh- that's even more reason for me to do it. So do you think? Do you think that? Why do you feel that pressure? Because is it because you're listening to? five different marketing podcasts that are telling you don't do this because you it'll hurt your list or because in the beginning this is born out of hobbyist yep. passion love and I don't know that there was a lot of I mean, I'm curious I mean do you think there's more self-censoring today than there was back in 2000 I think so I definitely think so I a lot of people are just following formulas and pod, the podcasts about podcasting are so niche that now it's podcasts about marketing your podcast and there's just like do this. Are using this. podcasts to market your product? Yeah, and it's just wow. There's a, a lot, and they're all saying the same thing. So if, imagine if you're new coming into the space, and and then you know you've probably heard it from. I'm sure all of us have heard it that that people starting new that say, well, I heard that you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. You know, I, and obviously new and noteworthy, eight weeks, blah blah blah. These people come in with some preconceived notions because of people have been. I guess training them that, that there's just only a certain way, and I just try to tell people, look, if you're doing it for out of a passion, then it does, there's no there's no wrong way. I think there's- an emerging status quo right now is have guests, have an interview show. I've seen podcasting tutorials that one of the main points is find great guests, and that's basically saying you need to have an interview show or you need to have a show where you have guests. No, you don't have to, and but that's kind of an emerging status quo. Maybe because it's, quote, easier, unquote, for people to have a show where they're not having to do much work. They're just making their guests do the work. Well, what they're trying to do is leverage their guest audience. I saw um, Chris Brogan complaining about this last week. You guys exactly. probably saw it too, where yep. the guy invited him on the show, then emailed him multiple times. Hey, the show's live. Please promote it. And Chris is like, hey, I don't, I'll get around to it. Just quit bugging me. And I told Chris, I'm like, well, you know, five other guys told him that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah, that's I was going to say, send, send, that. Me, send me the email that so I can tell you whose format he used from the course. Because <laughs> <laughs> I used it on that person. To, yeah, exactly. So here's the thing. We've done podcasting best practices on here. You've got essentially four of us who have shows about 
podcasting. They it, almost certainly people watching this or listening to this uh, have heard us give out advice after advice after advice about what to do. And you know, so at some point, are we part of the problem? Are we creating the status quo? Right. I mean, I always tell people, look, these are general tips that might save you some headache and time. Right. But please do your own thing. Please do something I've never seen before. But, you know, at, on some level, all of us that are just trying to help for the most part, at least that's, I think, how we all start our shows, we are creating a little bit of that status quo. Do you agree? Dave, are you part of the problem? <laughs> oh, I'm absolutely the problem. <laughs> I, uh, I think part of it, though, what I, I, my excuse is why, we're, why it's okay for us to do that. I think every single one of us back it up with a why. You know, even if it's me going bonkers on Audello, I had my reasons. I might have wanted to dig a little deeper, but we usually, you know, the Audio 2100 is, is uh, Audio Technica 2100 is great because it's USB, it's XLR, and it's the cheapest mic out there that sounds good. It's not just pick this mic because it's pretty. Um, although in some certain circles that might be okay, but that's, you know, we have our reasons. But on the other hand, if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I think you should use this media host. I'm going to go, here's my criteria. Does it fit it? Yeah, okay, You, I would use those. And if not, here's why I wouldn't want to use it. Like, one of the status quos might be, you know, we've been saying for the longest time, you have to add your ID3 text to your MP3 file. And I'm like, unless somebody downloads it and listens to it on Windows Media Player, I'm like, does that get shown anywhere anymore? Daniel? In some Android players, it does get shown still. Yeah. So that's still part of that. So there's an example. It's like, yes, that is still the status quo. We need until nobody is reading that. We need to keep tagging our files, I guess. I mean, there's a difference between something that's status quo and it's just, or something that's just common sense to do. Yeah. Like if you want a, a decent sound, you know, and, and you only have 50 or 60 bucks to spend, there's a handful of, things, of mics you could probably use. And, and why, why not give someone a head start? And I think we're just helping ourselves when we tell new people to, to hit the ground running with a quality show because now it's just you, our ears are trained when you hear someone using uh, the earbuds or they're in a room that's super echoey. And it's just I have like a limited patience because, like you said, Ray, there's so many other quality shows now coming on competing for our attention that – the the ones that don't sound good aren't going to stand a chance. And yeah. they stand out. It's it's you know, 15 seconds in, you know when somebody's got a show and they're sounding like this, <laughs> like, you know, that's just not going to work. Well, and, and and you know when we started, that was fine because it was about creating a medium, and you didn't have a reference point necessarily. But now, the game, you know, the level has been increased across the board that the bad stuff does stick out a little bit more. Like, I, I would listen to bad content in the beginning because I was so amazed that I was listening to content at all, right? Or I was so amazed by the technology. Now that's normal, and you're going to have to you're gonna have to win me over with the content. And then if it sounds really bad, I, I might have other options because there are a lot of people playing probably even in your same niche, right? But, Daniel, what does the status quo mean? to you challenging the status quo? Well, I think like we're talking about here, you have to first define what is the status quo and is the industry really mature enough that there is quite a status quo? I yeah. think there is, but the status quo for our industry changes more rapidly than other industries because our industry is still being so technology based. It's going to change due to the nature of technology. So I think the status quo right now is interview shows it is or something like having a highly produced show and using your podcast for your business so if you start a podcast and it's just to have fun just to build a community just to make friends or talk about your passions i think in a way that's challenging the status quo now because that's yes how we started with podcasting but now look at how people are using podcasting most of the successful podcasters are using it as part of a business are any of us challenging the status quo? We have a podcast about podcasting with a podcast about podcasting with a podcast <laughs> about podcasting with a podcast about podcasters. Like, I mean, do you guys feel or do you feel like there's something you can do or would like to do with the medium that you're not currently doing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this show for me is a little bit of that. A yeah. little bit of that. When this tech was born, which is Google Plus Hangouts on Air, I just wanted to have the conversations I was already having on Skype. Right with my with my buds, and there were no rules. There's no intro bumpers to this. 
There's no outro. Um, you know, I don't think it's not a challenge to the status quo per se, but it's a challenge for me. It's a lot less formal than I've ever done a show before. Um, it's live. So it's a little different. I'm not challenging the status quo, but it's a little different. I mean, what about you guys? But I think it's what uh, Rick alluded to, just kind of putting yourself out of your comfort zone. So you're doing a bit of a high wire act here because anything and everything can happen. And it's sort of like the feeling we should be getting, I think, what, what Saturday, Saturday Night Live was after when it, mm -hmm. it started airing those those uh, skits live and then you can it, it's fun to watch sometimes when they screw up and they start laughing in between in the middle of their yeah. skit and sort of reminds you that it's live and I think the the formal um, the formality of the podcast world now we're losing a lot of that we're losing a lot of that spontaneity and so and that's something that I could try is just do a straight live episode even if it is an interview just do go on go on site. Uh, with the Zoom and do straight live, no, 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 no cuts, and just put it out there as it is, warts and all. I mean, the early days of Saturday Night Live, I remember when you'd watch that and go, "Oh, I can't believe they're talking about that," or "Man, they really they said that about the president." So it was super edgy without being blue, which was kind of cool at the time. And and it's over the years kind of been, you know, watered down, and and they still occasionally, but that was that was really cool at the time. Every it reinvented itself multiple times. Saturday Night Live is a great um, piece of content, for lack of a better word, or a model for people to look at as something that was completely different. Um, you could say it went way back in the day, and I don't, I don't think any of you guys are as old as me, except for maybe Dave. Um, but the Jack Benny show, which I didn't see in its first run. I watched reruns. <laughs> Not that old. Rochester. Yeah. That was sketch comedy like yeah. Saturday Night Live. But it was different. They did something different. They took something old and they made it new. And um, so I'm hearing a common theme from all of you guys is be original. Um, and, you know, somebody said – you need to know the rules before you can break the rules. That's a musician thing. You know, you learn, and you guys, I think, provide a great service. You you guys are geekier than me talking about, oh, you need to have this, uh, you know, piece of gear, or the, or you need to, what well, you guys were just talking about with the uh, RSS feeds. That's too, you know, too geeky for me. But <laughs> you need to know that. Uh, all of us that aren't, that's not what we're naturally drawn to. It, it is incumbent on you to be professional, right? And make your content as good as it can possibly be. Ray, you said before we got started, you know, how OCD you were to make sure that stuff looked just right. And just for people, I think it's an interesting, Ray. You told me, you know, raise my chair or lower my camera so we all had, we're all at the same level here. That is important. And it's a difference that most people won't even notice. But at least consciously, but subconsciously they do. It just feels better. And, and feeling is probably the right word. But once you know those rules, then you can consciously break them. And people recognize it when you do it. Then it goes, whoa, what did they just do? Yeah, that's what excites me about podcasting is, is actually the generation behind us because less and less they're growing up with traditional media and they're born into this world and I'm hoping to see stuff that I've never seen. Like, I would have never thought of... That, that's a show I would have never thought of creating. You guys did something with that, even interview show, that was just so different than we've seen in the past. I'm looking forward to that. So I, the rules, break the rules, I use that one all the time. I love mm -hmm. that one, right? I mean, because it is important. Like, you know, as a, as a videographer and someone who dabbles in video, I need to know how to control that camera. Right, if you're going to use, there is a shutter speed that you use, right? It's very uh, specific for traditional filmmaking. But if you know why to use a different shutter speed, like the way they used it in the beginning of Saving Private Ryan, there was an artistic element to breaking the rules. So I think it's very important. And so, yeah, I totally agree with that. And so, Max, by the way, to, just to, just to, just to um, go back to something we talked about earlier, again, I think is going against the status quo is learning from history. Mm. Most people don't, just like you said again earlier, you know, people calling uh, Ira Glass the pod father. Right. You guys would laugh at that. They're like, what? You're a newbie. But learning that history 
allows you, again, to learn those lessons, to learn those rules, and to apply those lessons to whatever you do. Um, and I don't think most people do that. They don't know that. They, they look – somebody was just talking the other day about uh, – somebody getting frustrated because they, they were done five episodes of their podcast and they weren't getting successful yet. <laughs> like five episodes. You know, there are people who do this for years before their audience finally catches on. Um, and, I'm uh, sorry, one other thing. Again, learning from traditional media. You know, in traditional media, people don't do the same show forever, whether it's radio or TV or whatever. They might be on a TV series for a year, and maybe it's a flop. It's only a pilot. And then they might do a TV series for five years, they have a good run, and then boom, they're on to something different. I think a lot of us could learn from that and not just say, oh, I do this podcast, and this is the podcast I'll do till the day I die. And that's interesting because I think a lot of us, I think when you start a show, like if you plan to stick around, that that's it. Like that's my show. I mean, and at some point, like we may come up, I think they did this on She Podcast, and we can talk about Women in podcasting and challenge the status quo is an interesting one. Uh, certainly, women are not the status quo, but they're becoming. Uh, it's becoming more egalitarian, which I hope that happens. But um, at, on She Podcast, they talked about you know maybe you're just over it, right? You've done 200 episodes, you've kind of burnt out your content on that thing, and and maybe moving on or evolving past that. And, and so I, that's a very interesting point because I think that. When we start a show, we just kind of assume this is the show I'm going to ride out, right? Yeah. Well, I know, and just the way they evolve, uh, talking about old media, I was losing it because I grew up watching MASH, and I remember the last couple of seasons where it was really serious and dealing with just the mental um, wear and tear of being in war. And if you watch, like, the first season, it's almost like pull my finger kind Three's of. company, yeah. too. Yeah. And I was like, this was MASH? I'm like, really? It's like... Wow, and then it's so it's weird to see how that show evolved from where it started, and um, yeah, and it, it is hard. I mean, even at this point, I'm up, I'm, you know, pushing it on 500 episodes, and there are those times when I'm like, you know, thank God a new piece of technology came out because I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about today. What else do I have to say in this space, right? I mean, fortunately, we do have current events and new stuff happens. Things change, as Daniel mentioned. We are a rapidly evolving medium, so there is stuff to always talk about, but how do you do you maintain the passion over five years? And at, at some level, we've become a much different person than when we started the podcast. And maybe we've honed our skills so much that we would be valuable somewhere else as well. I don't know. It's an interesting, interesting thought. And there's going to there's be a whole new sl – there's a, a slew of – there's podcasters that are uh, coming up on board now who don't have the historical context and maybe that's good because they're just reinventing it and you know it happens in art and there's waves and you know like Salvador Dali you know who's going to be the Salvador Dali of podcasting right someone who just does something so weird so abstract that you're just like scratching your head and like I can't believe he did that and it doesn't seem to make any sense it breaks every single rule quote unquote rule of podcasting but I still want to listen to it because maybe it's a train wreck and maybe you just like don't know what they're going to do on the next episode. And that's, I was just that, thinking War of the Worlds, Harry. Who, yeah. Who's going to do the War of the Worlds of podcasting? Well, um, I mean, we did get to see something like this recently, and people were like, oh, yeah, I'm sick of hearing that. But Serial was a moment, right? I yep. mean, something happened. It, we wonder what's gonna, who's going to come in and do the next big thing that might push podcasting forward. Now, I'm, saying, I'm not saying Serial pushed it forward. But what happened with Serial? Why wh were they challenging any normal things that we had set in podcasting and it exploded? What What do you think happened there? I By mean, the way, isn't it status quo to be a serial hater? Yeah, <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> I, I think we're this American Life was a great snapshot. Like each episode was a different story. The fact that Serial, hence the name, was a serialized. It was the same story every week that made people go on, you were like, and they did a great job of next week on Serial, and you're like, and you're just like, oh, I can't wait to, get to get, you know, we're all just, you know, the first, the first, the first episode's free, you know, it was like a drug dealer, and then you're just, <laughs> and the complete opposite of, you know, Netflix with, with their binge watching of TV stuff, right, they went backwards, and it was cool, I, 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 
I don't really like the show serial. It just didn't interest me. But I think what they did, every podcaster should pay attention to. I'm not saying you should copy them. But what they did, like you said, Ray, was a moment. It was significant. It was, part of it was because those guys already had an audience and almost anything they would have done, somebody would have listened to it to begin with or, or a lot of somebody's. But there was something cool about that format. And uh, by the way, I know from a couple of people I've met with recently, there are thousands of people copying it right now. Yeah, there's a podcast about how to create audio drama. So it's a, in a way, it's a podcast about podcasts, but it's a podcast about how to create a, a serial type podcast. So. Yeah, and we see that. I mean, someone does something really successful. The interview show, the rise of the interview, is is a direct result of people having not only podcast success but monetary success with podcasting. Uh, you know, I think Daniel, you mentioned John Lee Dumas, right? And and how he actually challenged the status quo when he came to podcasting, in a way. Yeah, John knew he wanted to have a daily show, and all of the podcasters he talked to at that point he didn't talk to any of us but the ones he talked to said don't do a daily show would you have said the same thing Daniel? no i would have said do a daily show actually really uh, yes i would have <laughs> and uh i know todd cochran might have even said yes do a daily show but uh, because more content means more opportunities to grow yeah. more opportunities to be found all kinds of great reasons for producing more content but he saw that, yes, there were entrepreneur interview shows before him, but he wanted something every single day, and no one was creating that. So in this world, uh, in a world, in a world. one yeah, week, so Wayne, one Wayne episode Becky per week, yeah. yeah, everyone was doing a weekly show, or most everyone was doing weekly shows. No one was trying to do a daily show, especially on that topic. So he challenged that, even though people were saying, don't do a daily show, you'll kill yourself on this, or no one wants to listen to a daily show. He did a daily show. And he succeeded with it. And now we see a lot of daily shows that are interview based, but right? It, it even that though he took something old. If you look at storytelling, right? There's always I don't know. We're a bunch of nerds, right? Let's look at Star Wars, right? You got hot. You got the uh, Luke Skywalker. He's got to overcome his his you know nemesis. He's got to believe in himself. He has this aha moment, right? What does he overcome? Look at any story. There's always like you have your hero. He's got a obstacle to overcome. He overcomes the obstacle. He gets the girl and rides off into the sunset. And if you look at John's questions, they're all meant to, you know, tell us about a failure you had. Tell us, tell us about an aha. It's it's a basic story. So yeah, it's it's uh, jo Joseph Campbell's uh, the hero's journey. Yeah, exactly. Thank yeah. you. So so you guys, this may could be an idea for one of you guys who has a podcast about podcasting. Most of them that I hear and I listen to a lot, at least once. Um, they're all about the the technology of being a better podcaster. So pod, 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 uh, Paul, this is pod, Paul Colligan's in, as I stutter through that. But I, where you're going is, is Paul's. He's like, you know, you always see, see a need, and I think that's where you're yeah. going. Yeah. So, so it's either you're talking about the technology of podcasting or the format of podcasting. You know, get Chris Brogan on your show and then email him ten times <laughs> to uh, get him to link to his friends. But... What about talking about the art? Uh, there's a guy who, who just died, uh, wrote a book called um, On Writing Well. And anybody who is a writer read this book. And m many of them read it multiple times. And it was about how to write good, how to write well, whether you're trying to sell something or whether you're trying to tell a story or an author, you're a journalist, whatever. They'll all tell you they've read that book. Um, who has a podcast like that to teach you how to either tell the story, be compelling, get people to, you know, make sure they they remind themselves they they want to sign up for that uh, feed and get it next week, yeah. um, not because you tricked them into it, but because the content was so compelling that they had to. Yeah, and I would say kudos to Dave and Daniel. I mean, hundreds of episodes, and I know that, and I think that we get the rub that we and Paul will give us the rub of yeah it's not the podcast where you go well, I'm going to talk about microphones I talk about microphones and mixers and and media hosting you can't do as many episodes as Daniel and Dave has done without branching out into the art of podcasting I mean art. it's so the beauty is that when a podcaster has been around enough in one one niche 
dive in, right? Sample a bunch of shows because you're probably going to find that just to generate that kind of content, they may have tackled other things, podcasting beyond the microphone, right? So, you know, but Paul has positioned himself as, as, as this is the podcast about the bigger picture, which I think is important because it shows that you can still move into a space that has plenty of great podcasters in it. There's still something to be said, right? And there is a, a podcast. We're we're going to tag team this uh, that does a podcast about oh, uh, reading engaging content. And the answer is Daniel, Eric K Johnson's <laughs> show. Yeah. It's it's great. And the name just escaped me. Uh, uh, podcast talent coach. Yes. Oh, it's the yeah. idea of in radio, you have talent coaches that you sit down, you listen to your show, and you go, okay, here's what you could have done better. And Eric's done that for years in radio. And when he came over to podcast, he's like, oh, man, these a lot of these guys are making the same mistakes that he made when he was new. i got to quit making it, make the earth shake over here. Uh, <laughs> he, you guys are making uh, the same mistakes that he made when he first got into radio. So he was like, man, I can, I can help these guys avoid some of the hurdles. So, And that was something that I thought of or was thinking of when I entered the space, because I felt like when I started my podcast about podcasting, I felt like the space was saturated with the two podcasts about podcasting <laughs> that I found. <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, Cliff Ravenscraft's podcast, Answer Man, and Dave Jackson's School of Podcasting. Those were the first two and only two podcasts about podcasting I knew of at that time. And I felt like I want to challenge the status quo here. I want to have the audacity to podcast and say something different than these guys are saying, because I found myself talking back to my <laughs> listening device saying, no, you're forgetting this, or what about this, or you didn't mention this, or wait, tell me more about that. And that's when I realized I need to do a show and say the stuff that I feel that others aren't saying or come from this, come at this from a different perspective that I felt that others weren't discussing. And that's how the Audacity to Podcast was then born. And I think we all... And maybe this is revealing too much. I don't know. Probably not. But we all, uh, to some extent, groan when we see a new podcast. Actually, I could say it this way. Enter any space that already seems to be pretty saturated. But I mean, I to, your, to, to your point, Daniel, we could, we could take all of our shows and then rotate the hosts and just swap the host. It would be an entirely <laughs> different show. Like we oh, could, yeah. Even if you had the same script and we said the same thing that you said. Oh, yeah. We would just have like an intonation, a, 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 a joke or, or something, uh, uh, a take on a certain topic, and it would just turn it into a completely different show with a completely different audience. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we do rejoice when we see, okay, someone comes into this niche that already seems saturated, but oh, they discovered a new perspective. Like uh, when um, Brian from ProfitCast launched his show, I thought, okay, another podcast about podcasting. Oh, no, he's focusing on profit, not just money as profit, but what else you can gain from that. And and other podcasts about podcasting that have launched or just any podcast out there that launches that does have a truly unique take, like Eric K. Johnson's uh, Podcast Talent Coach. Great take on something that some of us might only hit every now and then. He focuses on that. We need, uh, we need a podcast casting couch. <laughs> oh, is that a video show? Is that the? <laughs> I don't. That's dangerous territory. Yeah, um, adult only. I, I yeah, love that's uh, adult only podcast. Uh, podcasters group therapy because it's Nick and Corey, and then it's Tawny, and you're like, oh wow, a female that's going to talk about microphones. That's not just she podcasts. I love that show too, but you know, to mix and match and to get both points of view and the fact that that Tani will be the first to say that when she first started off, she wasn't very technical, but now she's kind of coming on board. It's just, it's, it's, yeah, they're still talking, you know, growing your audience and email lists and, and that kind of stuff, but it is a, a little different perspective. Well, Dan Benjamin, right? A podcast method. Yeah. There's another guy that wants me to buy a Mac mini for every guest. I'm like, I'm, dude, that's not my strength. Okay. <laughs> Ro Ro Roman Castro in the chat says that would be cool. Podcast takeovers. And, I had Dave take over one of my shows, and I think actually the audience enjoyed that, so that was cool. Steve Stewart did it with, uh, oh man, we mentioned Steve Stewart. Next uh, oh. it's, been, it, it's probably been a while. It's probably been a while. He did the uh, he does the April Fools thing where he he takes over people's shows, so that's cool. Awesome. Well, you know, my show's not 
regular, so I'm going to have to get him in the seat as an excuse. I think that would just make Ray squirm if someone took over his show and just started <laughs> uh, yeah, because, so, uh, so the, my The perception is that I'm pretty OCD, then. That's what I'm picking up out of this round. <laughs> you said it yourself. Yeah, I can admit. I'm a little angry. But that's a good thing. Right. Again, well, you know, and we had a whole conversation. Here's the beauty of the roundtable. Here's why you want to be on the roundtable, podcastroundtable.com slash guests, because the lead up. So before any, before you do something live, you got to gather people and you, you talk a little bit. Great conversations there. The best, some of the best roundtables are when I say wave goodbye, everybody, and it, we stop live streaming. We're geeks. We're sitting here again. I started the show because it's a conversation that I'm already having on Skype that wasn't recorded. Now it's recorded. At some point, we have to stop. Don't think we don't go on for an hour talking you about. To, you have to release those podcasts well, this, roundtable after I, hours. After well, I know. Well, here's the thing: is here's why it's so fun. Get in, get your name on the list because look, we have Rick today. We're gonna we're gonna probably ask Rick some stuff that he might not want to say in a live stream. I don't know, but <laughs> I'll say he anything. might not tell us. He, he will. He'll say anything. We can well, get don't they, do, we do it now. Do, do what the Daily Show does, and they said those those uh, interviews are so compressed. You're like the five minutes. I don't know right. why they bother coming on, but then they say go to the website and watch us for the next yeah. ten minutes that we cut out. Yeah. Jimmy Fallon does great. That you can see right now blazed across my chest. They did not pay me for this. They should be here. This is the new. This is the revenue model for Podcasters Roundtable in the future. It's gonna be I'll wear your T-shirt, right? So you can I've me. been thinking about that too. Yeah. Like all of my Somebody's videos. Somebody's already done that, guys. Yeah, I know, but no, that, that's what I'm saying. We are not, we are not challenging status quo, but we're making money. <laughs> Pay me some money. So Meerkat, though, Meerkat and Periscope, you know, that's one thing cool. I'm probably gonna turn on Meerkat for the first time. So follow me, podcast over on Meerkat or Ray Ortega, on the after show, and um, it gives access that you don't necessarily have before. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's something to say for, you know, putting in that extra bonus content. But I don't forget my original point was, but the point is sign up because we have awesome conversations even when the stream stops. So, yeah. I was thinking of, I've got a an idea that I, obviously every podcaster has an idea for 10 more podcasts. But exactly. I was trying to take myself out of the loop because I'm a self, also a self-professed productivity nerd. So I said, what about a podcast where the host keeps changing and the, the 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 host interviews the next guest or something. I don't know. I haven't figured mm. out the logistics yet, but it's kind of like a chain. So then you take yourself out of it, and then every week it's like a different. That's a logistical. There is nightmare. a um, uh, there is a podcast right now. I think it's Laura Lapkiss. Um, yeah, with special guest Lauren Lapkiss. So her podcast is she brings in a new host every week, and she's the guest every week. <laughs> That sounds a <laughs> little egotistic, but well, she's <laughs> interviewing me again. Tell me more about me. I get it. I get. <laughs> she's does she email? It's really funny. Does she the email host email her? Yeah, yeah <laughs> ten times saying, "Hey, you're going to promote this to your audience." Yeah, <laughs> she should. You know what the thing is when we kind of hit on this is that you know one of the interesting aspects of podcasting, and I think that people may show up for the content, but they probably stick around for the person, the host, right? Yep. A large part of it. So you may listen to Dave, Daniel, or me, and you may have been listening to Daniel for a long time, and you hear Dave, and you're like, oh, you know, Dave just really hits on me. He gets me. I get, or I get Dave. And they either pick up Dave and drop Daniel, or they pick up a new show, which is often the case. That would never happen. That never happens. I go by Please. who has the, be the better James Brown impersonation. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> that is your that's your metric. Uh, I I'm not even gonna tackle that one. Dave, get out your guitar. Um, Dave wins. But you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's a challenge. So did that made me think of having a rotating host? You know, does podcasting have something unique in that it's it's connection to the podcaster? Was that a question? Sure. <laughs> I just toss it out. Whether hey, they can't all be winners, Rick. Yeah, well, I think I think it's unique the fact that you don't have to go through a program director mm -hmm. to get that approved. I mean, you you hear there's a guy in in Cleveland that's just horrible. He's your, I mean, he is Binky and the Wiz. And uh, all I hear him talk about, well, we're gonna do this contest where we're gonna you know have the guy stand in their underwear and we're gonna toss frozen turkeys at them. But it's they're always trying to get go way too far and they've got to get everything approved. And I'm like, man, it's kind of cool. I don't have to get stuff approved. If I want to do some sort of bizarre weird episode, I just do it. But the school the of podcasting. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Ray. I was just saying, school of podcasting. Let's let's take you out of there and and 
and put Harry in your seat. That's, you know, there's a problem there, right, for your for your audience. What's the guy's name? Uh, he was a radio guy for a long time, and um, he had nobody on his show. He couldn't. He was getting no listeners. He's oh. getting no call-ins. So he started inventing people who said outrageous things. What's his name? I'm forgetting it. It sounds yeah. familiar, but he's, he's hilarious. So, yeah, Phil Henry. Yes. Phil Henry. So this guy created all these fictitious characters who would call in and say outrageous things, and then other people would call in and say, "Get that idiot off the air," and uh, and his show blew up. He he was at NAB, um, hmm. as was another guy, Tom Likas, who was. Uh, I feel like someone mentioned. was telling me that there was a podcast like that, which I'm sure is a direct, just extraction of that concept. Oh, homage. And maybe yeah, Phil Henry so doing a podcast now. I could be wrong about that. But uh, the other guy I was thinking of, Tom Likas, who yeah. was an L.A. shock jock, is now a podcaster. He, he was there at, uh, at NAB as well. Um, I have one other little – this is my own personal uh, nit to pick. A way to, sta- cha- to, to challenge the status quo is when you're going to do a live show, and you did very good, Ray. Start on time. Oh, no, we don't start the show ever. In ever. traditional radio, okay, and, and in new media, this is a thing, right? We start late. We end early. We, you know, something happens. In traditional radio or TV, the show is on when you expect it to be on, every time, on time, all the time. Yeah, definitely. We were one minute late, so wow. That is a tough <laughs> crowd. But um, uh, No, 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 no. I'm Ray, not saying Ray you personally. Ray OCD about everything. No, one no. Minute, I, one minute's not a big deal. It really wasn't about you because I thought you did a pretty good job. But yeah, oh, no, we start late all late. the time. <laughs> but being on time is challenging the status quo. Yes. And, and if you're going to be live. For podcasting, clearly not the status quo. I mean, that's the, new, that's the normal. People expect well, that was your topic. Trouble. Right, uh, challenging the status quo in podcasting, and if I don't you know change, if you're. T- but I would say you're not challenging. It's not like a rebellion, right? People aren't being like, "I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be one minute late because I'm not radio in your right. face," right? So exactly. It's, it's a lack of organization. They just they <laughs> drop the ball. They, they, I'm not gonna even give you credit for challenging the status quo. You just I, drop the ball. I hate when I am late personally. Yeah. Uh, because there's a saying that I remember that always reminds me to get my ass moving if I'm going to be late. People find fault in those who make them wait. The longer people wait on you, the more they're thinking, you know, that guy, he did this before and he did that. This other thing I don't like about that guy, because all they can think about while they're waiting on you is what they don't like about you. Or, or he just doesn't care enough to show up on time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. I, yeah. So, as we wrap it up and we, and we head out here, let's. Give me one more thing, if you have it. Looking forward uh, in podcasting, where we're at now, whatever we consider normal now, what do you think you could do, or what do you think the, the podcasters who are listening to this, the potential podcasters, what do you think that they could do to challenge the status quo? Or does a new podcaster even want to do that? Right? I mean, like, <laughs> what's that, Harry? Release your episode when you damn well feel like it. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Here's the thing, and I was going to bring this up. Here's the beauty of podcasting. There's no out. All right, If you guys have to bail, you can bail, but we are going to keep going. Hardcore History is a show uh, that has been around since the beginning, I think, and it is a top-rated podcast. And I don't know. What do they do? I just listened to my first quarter episode because these things can be four hours long at a clip. And they might, he might do, Stan Carlin might do eight episodes a year for me, that's it's almost like a audio book, and almost like a it's almost like an audio book. You know, it's less than it is my definition of podcasting, which is every week. But his numbers do not suffer for this, and Rob Walsh will hold that out in his in his speeches about Libsyn. But they're four hours long, maybe only eight episodes a year. Top rated podcast, right? He doesn't follow what you would consider. Uh, the status quo when it comes to podcasting. So you might have something there, uh, Harry, which is release. You know, and I think we've heard recently, uh, Dave, you've t- probably the first person I heard, who will talk about, you know, publish when it's ready, right? Not because yeah. not because it's Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, to me, I would rather hear a great episode on Tuesday than a crappy episode on time on Monday. You yeah. know, I did that just this week when yeah. we're recording this now. I skipped an episode. I recorded it initially. I kind of shortcutted myself even, uh, 
shortcut myself in that I didn't have my studio set back up yet. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just record into one of these USB microphones and I'll make my podcast about doing bare minimums. Well, I recorded it and I did bare minimum of preparation too. And I hated the episode. I didn't publish it. I just instead put out something else because I didn't have time to redo it because I'm in the process of trying to move. And I also had to reset my studio after uh, moving some things around. And that's, that's I'll challenging you, my own status quo I'll of that really thing. bugged me. It, it maybe this would not work in podcasting at all, but you know, a lot of uh, radio people allow you to download their radio show as a podcast. And if you ever go to a radio show and for whatever reason the host's sick or he's on vacation, or they they typically will have a guest host. But if they don't do that, they'll play a best of show. Yep. Could you do a best of podcast instead of your normal episode if you can't get that normal episode out? What about reruns? Right. Can you even do that? Because, again, you it's can. already there. People just have to go find it, right? It's, it's already there. But is it uh, violating the cardinal rule of reposting the same podcast again, making it available for download? Repurposing. Yeah. I, th I would tag it that way and say, hey, uh, you know, whatever, I'm under the weather. There's some reason why I'm not here this week. Yeah. And uh, here's some of the you know, most commented on episodes and, and then play a snippet and make like a little... I mean, they did that all the time in TV. You'd be watching Family right. Ties and they'd be like, remember the time, Alex? And then they'd go off to Dreamland and play a bunch of clips. Every TV show would rip us off with those yeah. episodes. There's always one week yeah. and you're like, oh, this is a remember yeah. back when... Ring, 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 ring. And it's like, oh, it's a dream sequence. You know, if I did something that like that where idea. I did a rerun of an episode... Um, what I would do is I would only leave it in the feed until I release my next episode. It would just be something for in case you missed this hashtag, I see whatever it is. Um, in case you missed it, here's this old episode, but I'm only going to leave this in the feed until I have a new episode. That way they have something to listen to that they may not have heard before, especially if your RSS feed is limited to how many episodes you have in it, where it might be practically impossible for them to have listened to an older episode if the content's good, they might it might make a good refresher, but I wouldn't leave that in there because it's not technically a new episode. Okay. I've seen people just rep repost their first episode because I think it was an anniversary. So it was like, oh, it's for episode fifty. I'm going to play episode one, <laughs> and they yeah. I mean they mention it, but uh, that's but we can get outside of best practices and just say try it. I mean, like you, Hen yeah. uh, Harry, you talked about walking around London, recording yourself, and just publishing it because you didn't have an episode yeah. to go an interview or whatever it was right so you know it, it the beauty is you can just you can try what you want and you can adjust right the audience will understand if you're making a you know an honest effort to either maintain your schedule or give them stuff they haven't seen. you know most people you've built that audience they trust you right and if they hate it respond to it Clear it up and fix it, right? So, well, like you like you said, give them a reason to come back next week or next time or next eleven days if you're on some re really weird schedule. But just say, I I can't wait to hear what he's gonna talk, who he's gonna talk to, or what he's gonna talk about next week. And because I guess when they get to the point that it's predictable and they know what they're getting every week from you, then they're just gonna go find someone else. I think. Cool. Well, let's wrap it up. Let's give you, uh, you know, once again. Let us know who you are. We don't have any lower thirds up here, so let us know who you are if you didn't know already. Uh, one place we can find you. That's one URL. And uh, if you have any parting advice, feel free to interject and we can talk for another 15 minutes, whatever it is. But, uh, yeah, thanks for listening to another roundtable. And, Daniel, thanks for uh, operating the co-hosting duties once again. Thank you. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the Audacity to podcast.com. We mentioned Chris Brogan a couple times here because of his recent thing about being a, a interviewee and I'm happy to announce I just secured Chris Brogan as a guest <laughs> for an episode of the audacity to podcast we're going to be talking about pet peeves of a podcast interviewee so we're not awesome. going to tell you about how to interview people we're going to tell you what annoys us when people interview us so I'm, that, that'll be at the audacity to podcast.com we're challenging that norm super meta Awesome. We love a good Pet Peeves episode here, or we call them rounds, <laughs> on the roundtable. So looking forward to it. Thanks again. Dave Jackson, uh, co-host extraordinaire. Your check is in the mail, man. Thanks for joining us.
Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, Dave Jackson from schoolofpodcasting.com, and uh, it should be interesting to see what my next episode will be because I'm, I'm not going to get to sleep before it comes out, so it'll be uh, entertaining, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, stretch that out as long as possible because <laughs> we're going to get some binky in the whiz, and it's going to be great. <laughs> it's great stuff. People are like, what the heck is that? That's, you know, that's inside stuff that I'm not even... You're going to have to go find out what that is for yourself if you're interested. Good stuff. All right, Harry, returning roundtabler. See you twice now. Closer to the t-shirt. Yeah. Long way to go, buddy. Thanks for joining like us. I, I feel like I need a middle initial because it just sounds so much more official when, when Daniel... <laughs> Harry, Harry A. Duran. <laughs> well, since I don't have one, every time I come on, I'll just add a letter. So since this is my second time, it's Harry B. Duran. And... <laughs> Uh, the website is podcastjunkies.com. I say you just put a tack on an extra Duran to the end, and it's much more fun. Harry Duran yeah. Duran. I, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Let's just, it's all right. Me too, man. I probably had a flock of seagulls haircut. No, I did not. <laughs> all right. Rick Halvert, thank you so much for being our new roundtabler, first-time roundtabler, and hopefully we'll get you back on here. Honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Rick Calvert, I'm the CEO and co-founder of New Media Expo. Uh, people can email me, rick at NMX events, or go to the site, nmxlive.com. Very cool, and I can kind of see us in the corner there. It looks like you've got the broadcast up behind you, so uh, I can see a mic arm. So it didn't even kill your bandwidth, so we got to come over to your house and do an episode. Yeah, very nice. All right, everybody, thanks to the chat. You guys rocked it once again, and uh, I had a blast. And if I'm going to challenge my own status quo and, and just not give you the normal out. I'm just going to say, oh, I think I just did it. Well, not the, the audio people, they didn't, you, you, didn't see, you couldn't see that, so we're good. Bye, everybody. <laughs>